stars are brightly shining. It's the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error. It's that time of the year, hear the sleigh bells ring. You can feel it in the air, let's celebrate with everything. Blow the trumpet, play the strings, and let the caroling begin. Brothers and sisters, gather around. It's time to sing, make a joyful sound. Light the tree, let it shine. To each other, let's all be kind. Bring the presents and share the love. Be the hands and feet of the Lord. It's a season of comfort and joy where we celebrate the newborn boy that was born in a manger. Jesus Christ, our Savior, He came to bring hope to the weary and the lost. He came to bring peace to all who believe. He is the light of the world. This is the real reason for our celebration. God came to earth to bring us salvation. Angels and shepherds witness and praise this miracle baby that was born to reign. Let every heart make room this season to adore our Savior, King Jesus. So put up your lights and decorations and let them shine bright. Together with all nations, we'll celebrate Jesus Christ. Turn up the music everywhere to praise His name and let every song declare that for us, He came. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Over the past couple of Sundays, we here at Mag Church have been looking at Christmas in a very different and unique way. Now, we all understand that Christmas is a crazy time of year where we are going a million miles an hour just trying to pick the perfect present for everyone on our list and exhausting ourselves by the hustle and bustle and even travel to the point that after all of it's done, we don't even feel like we really got to enjoy it. That's kind of the special thing about Advent. Advent causes you to stop. It is meant to make you reflect on what's going on inside of you and even what's going on outside of you. It is meant to cause you to face your greatest aches and pains and to ponder what they're all about. That is why this season invites you to look at things like hope, peace, joy, 
and love. Because they are all things that we search for. And their absence, as we all know, makes life difficult. And take love, for instance. Is there anything that has caused as much pain for us as a pursuit of love? It may be a reason for the issues of mental health that many of us struggle with even today. It's certainly most likely the reason we decide to never allow anyone to ever get close to us. Because loving someone unconditionally and watching them give up on you or even ghost you, it's devastating, isn't it? This pursuit may single-handedly be the reason for the mess in our lives that we are still cleaning up, even today. I mean, why even search for love if it can devastate our lives this much? Do you ever find yourself having difficulty believing in love as much as God does? Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but for me, it's hard to trust that love is going to win. I would even say it this way, sometimes it's hard to trust love at all. Now, what you may find interesting is that by the close of the first century, Christianity is struggling with this same concept. In fact, the three books by John that we find towards the end of the New Testament are letters written to encourage believers that are going through a crisis. The crisis is that a group of people have broken off from the church and denied Jesus being the Messiah and the Son of God. And because of this, these people have stirred up hostility towards those who have stayed faithful to following Jesus and have made their life really difficult. In the second and third letters of John that this conflict is revealed in all of its messy detail, complete with all of the groups involved and the people involved that have been causing the damage. Now, John is trying to remind this church about the teachings of Jesus by weaving in and out ideas of life, truth, and love and what they look like when you are following Jesus. So John constantly uses terms like light and love to describe this message of God. And one of the powerful key words that John uses to bring this idea home is the Greek word koinonia, which means to participate in sharing. Now in most of our English translations, it's translated as the word fellowship. But I personally don't think that that word can fully contain what John is trying to say. You see, for John, he sees us as full participants who share in the full life and love of God. Now, this isn't a take pity on you type of love. No, no. This is the type of love revealed in a God who takes on flesh and enters into the mess that we have created. This is a God who becomes light by turning on the searchlight to find you. It's a full out rescue mission. It's why John wants us to know one simple fact, and that fact is this, that God is love. But John goes even deeper than that by making this kind of outrageous declaration that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and that nothing was created without this Word. It's meant to bring us back to the book of Genesis to ponder the creation account and see it in a whole different light. It is meant to reintroduce us to what we already know, that this Jesus that we serve is full of, of grace and truth, that when life is difficult and dark, that we can remember a simple verse that many of us have probably memorized, but because of its redundancy, we have lost the power of what it reveals. You know what verse that is? John 3, 16. Now, here's what John 3, 16 says. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, what I find is that most of us have probably memorized John 3, 16, but not 17. 
And, and it's just as powerful because here's what 17 says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, when it, concerning John 3.16, I, I believe that probably most of us have memorized this verse in Sunday school or maybe even for some children's church game to get a prize. But if perhaps never had our hearts arrested by the mystery that it contains. And I think I know why. Because for a lot of us, it's, it's hard to comprehend how an all-powerful God who created the world with just a word could love us. I mean, even for myself and probably even like you, 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 we all understand this, that it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe this because sometimes we feel as if no one loves us. And it's even harder to see this truth when we can barely find a reason to love ourselves, right? We have been so wounded and so damaged and so hurt and so broken by so many people that we live our lives behind a fortress of protection, not wanting anybody to get close for the fear that they could do what others have done to us, and that's break our heart. And so we constantly live in this jaded, cynical, and numb reality. There isn't a person here today who hasn't been struck by the thorn in the pursuit to get the rose. Now, here's something that I know is going to kind of hit you a little hard. And I even know that you're going to think, man, I don't want to hear that. But I think it's something that we need to hear and we need to maybe even wrestle with a little bit. But I've told you that there is a certain gift to having your heart broken. Because what I have found is that a broken heart reminds us of our own humanity. It reminds us that as much as we attempt to try to be our own God, that we actually fail miserably at it. I would even say this, that without suffering from a broken heart ourselves, we would lack empathy and sympathy for other people. Because a lot of times, it's only because of what nearly killed us that makes us vulnerable to the pain associated with the struggle of others. Because you can't have a testimony without first having a test. Now, near the end of John's Gospel, John records this interesting account between Jesus and one of his disciples known as Peter. Now, Peter is the disciple who had a ton of promise, but would mess it all up in a night by claiming that he never knew the man that he had literally left everything behind to follow. And not only that, but also chose to dedicate his life to for the past three and a half years. The, the shame of this betrayal would cause Peter to go outside of the city walls and weep bitterly, Scripture tells us. But that's not really what I'm trying to highlight. What I'm trying to highlight is what Jesus does next, because it's that that shocks us to our core. You see, we are told that Jesus is beaten beyond recognition. His beard has been plucked from his face, and even the flesh on his back shredded but what the Romans called the cat of nine tails. He is made to carry his own cross to a hill that he will literally die on, where spikes will be driven into his hands and his feet, and where he will be then lifted up for people to watch and spectate as he slowly suffocates to death. But now, this Jesus, he sits at a fire eating with the very same disciples that deserted him and denied even knowing him. And as he sits there, he is fully alive, but yet still carrying the scars from what it was that killed him. And as he's eating, Jesus asked Peter one thing, really three different ways. And here's the question, do you love me? Now, normally, we would get a Peter that would argue his case for how ridiculous of a question this is for Jesus to ask him. Peter would normally bring up how loyal he had been to Jesus and how he would never let anything happen to Jesus. He would probably even tell him, I would even die for you, Jesus. But 
that isn't the Peter that we get. Because, well, he can't claim to be that Peter anymore, can he? He has been humbled by the shame of what he did, maybe even what he didn't do. He forgot about his first love, something that each and every one of us who follow Jesus understand how easy it is to do. And I think what baffles me is really Jesus. Because you would expect Jesus to be irate at this betrayal. You would understand if he showed up just to let them all have it, calling them every single name in the book. I mean, if anyone deserves to perish, wouldn't it appear to be the one who denied even knowing him right? But it's Jesus that asked Peter the question. That really, if you think about it, shouldn't it be Peter that's actually asking Jesus this question of, do you love me? But that's the ironic twist in it, isn't it? Because as Jesus is asking Peter this, it's like Jesus is asking Peter, have you gotten broken enough? Have you gotten roughed up enough, shamed enough, that my love for you has been soaked in enough to make you answer that question honestly for the first time in your life, Peter, of do you love me? And I'm not asking, do you love me by what I do for you? I'm not asking you, do you love me because of what I, what, what kind of status I give you? I'm asking you, do you love me for who I am? Do you really love me, Peter? And this is really a haunting question to answer because how we answer that question it reveals a lot. It reveals whether our love is, is conditional or unconditional. And this is what I find that you and I struggle with the most. Because the love that we have experienced is mostly conditional. It's the, I'll love you if you do this for me. And really, without saying it, what they actually mean is, but if you don't do it, I no longer love you. That is what we've struggled with. Because it causes us to live with a hole that leaks out the love that wants to find us. And when this happens, I find that we forget who we are. We forget what's true about ourselves, about others, and especially what's true about God. Mainly, that He is love. Now, what if this is the gift contained in the struggle of searching for love? That most of the time, its depth is revealed in something that we try to avoid at all costs, vulnerability. Where you're void of hope, void of peace, void of joy, and void of love. Because it's in the dark, chaotic vulnerability of the soul that I find the Spirit hovers over the water and reveals the depths of God's love for us. And the broken, roughed up, shame-ridden mess of a humanity, it's, it's in that condition that God sends His Son into. And He doesn't do it as a warrior king with this massive army. But crazily, as this small baby who is fragile and vulnerable. And what I find kind of crazy is that he isn't a God that wants to protect us from pain, even though that's probably what we want. We'd love to have a God that can spare us of any pain or hardships. But even throughout all the scripture, that doesn't seem to be what he does. He seems to be this God who wants to be with us in the pain. And I think the reason for that is because he knows that protection stunts intimacy. Because love is best shown in how you walk with the broken, how you walk with the hurting, which is exactly maybe what Christmas is meant to reveal. 
that in the darkest of situations, God still says, let there be light. So tonight, may you be undone by his crazy love that dares ask you if you love him during your greatest screw up. May his love be so overwhelming that it takes your breath away. And may you be at a loss for words as you behold the nail-pierced hands that doesn't hold what you did against you. And may this Advent season make you take the journey that the wise men took to find this child who was promised by angels in Luke 2, verses 10. And it says this, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I want you to think of that. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. We all want joy, don't we? Here's the thing. This Christmas season, may you come vulnerable and fragile before God. Here's the thing. You don't have to. You don't have to come with frankincense. You don't have to come with gold or myrrh. You don't have to come perfect with everything cleaned up. I would actually. I advise you to come with all of your brokenness, all of your heartache, all of your screw-ups, all of your shame, all of you. Because we are told that we can cast our cares on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. And may our vulnerability lead us to see this. May it lead us to see just how much God loves us. That He would send the Word incarnate to let us know that love does win in the end. One thing I want to let you know is that your search is over. Advent is here, and what you find in this, laying in a manger, is at the culmination of hope, joy, peace, and love. is isn't found in a feeling, it's found in a person. So, Merry Christmas. We are praying for you, and we can't wait to see what God does in this coming new year.